What's going on everybody? Michael Silva here. I can't believe my eyes. Holy moly, are we about to get a rally? Oh my goodness, and will it actually last? I don't always buy the dip, but when I do, it typically keeps on dipping. You're watching the Stock Market Brief Show. My name is Michael Silva. We're going to hop right into today's episode. The big news today that probably is not going to be covered anywhere. The 10-year and 3-month Fed staple curve that has inverted for the first time really since mm, 2019. And then we had a minor recession there during the obvious pandemic. And then the Fed obviously stepped in with unlimited quantitative easing. Now we talked about this yesterday. When this curve inverts, like it has here, here, um, and there, and now it just inverted again. Very shortly thereafter, we typically go into a recession. Now, are we going to go into a recession? Most likely, yes. Is it going to be global? Is it going to be big? There's a possibility, a very strong possibility of that taking place. Does that mean panic? No. We're going over this to prepare. Get your house in order. Pay off consumer debt, right? Get rid of pesky debt. Lower your expenses. Take care of what's in your house. Tell your family, tell your friends to do the same exact thing. Because if you are prepared in these times and you have your economic house in order, there's going to be opportunities coming outside of it. Remember the great financial crisis coming out of 2008? How much innovation came out from that recession. A lot of innovation, a lot of wealth was built. Okay, so there are going to be many opportunities, but you need to prepare to be ready for those opportunities, okay? Now, I want to take a look over here at this chart. This is the monthly chart of crude oil, all right? So like crude oil, WTIC, and I'm pointing out here the rate of change on the 12 months. And every time we got up into these very extended levels, we've you know, these peaks in oil, these rapid rises have has, have led to stock market sell-offs or stock market crashes or bear markets. And you can see here we had 1987, 1990, dot-com financial crisis. And then recently over here, which we pointed out when it was up at these levels. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter or if you follow this channel for quite some time, you'll remember that. I'm pointing this out now because guess what? Our rate of change just turned negative. We still have some time in the month, so it might not finish there. But that's not a good sign. Uh, what happens when that takes place? Well, take a look over here. So not all the time does it mean crash, but there are some instances where it did mean that we, hey, we got a crash. The dot-com, the financial crisis, when we got that 12-month rate of change, when it crossed down to negative territory, take a look what happened there, right? So we already sold off some there, and then we crashed big time. We already sold off some here. Are we going to crash big time? But you might look over here and say, hey, 1987 and 1990, um, actually, we started ripping up higher. So so why was that? Well, remember, there's, there's, there's a couple of things that took place. If we look at the quarterly chart, remember, uh, over here in 2000 and then over here in the great financial crisis, the start of it, and we were where we are right now, something very similar took place. Both, we had these inverted yield curves, right? The 10, 10 year, three month. And then we had actually two quarterly closes beneath the five EMA. Now you might be like, well, what does that even mean? Well, usually when we get a quarterly close beneath the five EMA, the Fed steps in. Don't believe me? Take a look at this date. Take a look at this date. Take a look at that date. Take a look at that date. And take a look at obviously the pandemic. The Fed stepped in when we had one quarterly close. Now you might be looking back. Okay, but what about 1987 and the 1990s right over here? Well, guess what? We did have this. Um, we had two quarterly closes right here, but we didn't end up having a crash right in 87 and then 1990. But what happened during that time? Well, if you don't remember, the statement that was issued in the one-day 1987 stock market crash, the, the Federal Reserve set, stepped in and said, we're going to, you know, consistent with our responsibilities, um, uh, the nation's central bank affirmed today its readiness to serve as a source of liquidity to support the economic financial system. So they stepped in and backed the markets. And as it stands right now where we are, the Fed is a hawk. They are tightening. This is bearish currently, and people are hoping and praying for a pivot, but we don't get a pivot until they actually pivot. So wait for the pivot, and when it happens, it'll happen if it happens. Okay, and if you continue on, okay, but what about the 90s? Well, throughout the 1990s, the Fed used monetary policy on a number of in, uh, of occasions, including the credit crunch of the early 1990s. So the Fed also stepped in here, saving it. Do you notice what's going on? So are we going to get a bounce? Yeah, people, right, when you see this, you all of a sudden think fear, uncertainty, doubt, ah, does not mean that we can't bounce. So I want to I want to I want to show you some things that are taking place um, currently that says to me that hey there's a possibility that we can get a bounce. 
what does that mean? It can mean just a bear market rally, okay? First and foremost, um, bonds, they hit a 52-week low. So when bonds hit a 52-week low, that's bearish, right? S strong stocks get stronger, weak stocks get weaker. The trend can continue, lower highs and lower lows. However, we did put in a nice little hammer candle here. Why am I talking about this? Well, if bonds actually somewhat, you know, play through this hammer candle, and we actually get, you know, a little bit of a bounce up, well, maybe perhaps, right, yields would obviously come down. And as we know, and you can see the little inverted ham hammer here, if this comes down, as we know, that allows for pressure to come off of heavy growth stocks. And what we've seen is a pretty strong correlation that when the 10-year yield rises, right, as we've been seeing here, this monster rise up, it puts pressure on growth stocks, including tech stocks. So the, you know, the thought process here is, hey, maybe if it backs off a little bit, it might not, you know, be a forever thing where stocks, you know, don't just keep rallying, rallying if this comes down, but it may offer a relief, okay? So that is what I am paying attention to. Keep in mind, like we are up around, uh, we closed at 30, almost 4%, right? Which is, you know, absolutely incredible. If this thing keeps pressing up higher and higher, yeah, there's going to still be a lot of pressure. We do have the PMO kind of flattening out here, right? That right there aligned with also this negative divergence. And you can see this is also negative divergence there too as well. So momentum to the upside may be slowing and they could offer us some potential short-term, potential long-term, we don't know, um, uh, relief in the markets. Another thing I want to call out here is the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. Okay, the NASDAQ McClellan oscillator has somewhat of a positive divergence on both the um, NASDAQ McClellan oscillator. So that's this one down here, sorry. We have this positive divergence. We have a low, a higher low, a higher low. Okay, so that's positive. Now we're actually getting some positive breath. And you can see here on the uh, NASDAQ composite, we had lower low, lower low, lower low. And that right there tells us, yeah, price was pressing down further, but the internals were showing some strength and we're starting to see a little bit of a move up to the upside. So that's positive. Okay. The next thing I want to point out is the summation index and the summation index looks like it's about to have that crossover. All right. The parabolic SAR most likely tomorrow will click down over, which could potentially obviously say, hey, we could see a temporary change in the trend. Be aware that we're still below zero. Okay, being below zero is not really a positive thing. You wanna be trending above zero, but that doesn't mean that we can't see some sort of a bounce. Now, the last time we were above zero and it crossed over, it led to this entire move to the downside. So the trend changed. The one prior to that, we had this click down from a bullish signal and it actually traded all the way up and that was that big bear market rally from the June bottom. Okay, now it doesn't mean that we can't have whipsaws. Like over here, we had multiple whipsaws. However, during that process, we also had a bullish divergence form. And then when we did have it back over here, when it clicked over, we saw the market rally up. Okay, so this is a big signal. I'm paying attention to it. It looks like it could potentially lead to a tradable bottom here in the near future. We also talked about the bullish percent uh, index here for the NASDAQ composite, right? So the bullish percent index for... Um, Sorry, this is for technology. I have the bullish percent index. I didn't show it. I shared it on the last video. This is BPINFO. This is for the tech sector. I wanted to just call out very similar to the bullish percent index for the NASDAQ composite. We have a bull we, bullish um, positive divergence. Sorry, man, I'm just chopping up all my words. But you can see here we have the uh, low to a lower low and we have a low to a higher low there in a very extended to the downside bottom area. So perhaps this can help the help, you know, hand, you know, seeing a somewhat of a bounce here in tech stocks. Okay. Uh, let's take a look also at the NASDAQ advanced decline lines. Right now, I'm not showing the NASDAQ advanced decline line. I'm, what I'm showing is two breath indicators, right? We can just, or, you know, breath uh, moving averages, 21 and 50. And what you want to see is these pointing up and above zero trading up higher. But what we do see here is we see that as the market was perpetuating downwards and continuing the trend down, this was actually showing some momentum, some strength to the upside. So that right there is a positive divergence and we're starting to see some nice moves to the upside. However, albeit they are very volatile. Now, as we know, Netflix reported earnings after hours and it um, looks like the market's interpreting it as good. We'll see how that follows through. Um, it was expecting a $30 move and guess what? We hit it pretty much on the T trading slightly there above that $30 expected move. So as far as the earnings go, it reached that level, the implied 
move based off of implied volatility um, in the pre-market session. We'll see what happens overnight and if it continues to move higher and or starts to back off a little bit. Now, Tesla is going to be reporting tomorrow after the market close. Currently, as it stands, we're looking at a plus or minus $18 move, which can take us to around 238 to a low of about 200. So a huge, huge range there in Tesla. So be very careful. Um, obviously, if it's bullish, right, we, we shoot up. If it's bearish, we shoot down. I'm not trying to handicap risk here. It feels like a complete gamble to me. From a bullish perspective, we are trading above that five-day moving average, which is rather neutral, but we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, but yeah, as it stands right now, I'll probably trade this for the most part, but I'm not going to be holding it you know, I'll, I'll trade it probably the next, the following morning um, after earnings. I don't, I don't like to play earnings uh, until the reports already come out. And then I see a trade setup actually take place. Um, unless if I have some sort of a big edge, but as of right now, I just, I just don't. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to risk my capital, capital doing that. Um, a couple other things that I want to go over that are bullish is the CPC indicator. It's not on a buy signal yet. And when we get these buy signals, we can see some stronger moves continuing to the upside as we've seen uh, on prior signals. Now, this hasn't updated yet. This is um, from yesterday, but I, you know, yesterday when I showed you, it was from the day prior, and we're right there next to the buy signal. So we'll see here if this starts crossing down. But overall, it is pointing down, and it looks like it's trending there as if, uh, you know, it could potentially reach there in the near future. Now, let's take a look at the charts themselves and give you an idea of what I'm seeing um, currently in the markets. Now, overall, today's price action very, very, very difficult for people to trade this. So if you're having a, if you're struggling, um, you know, I can understand, I can understand why, right? We had a big gap up this morning, a huge gap up. And that right there alone creates all kinds of FOMO as it starts. Now, an early morning note that I sent out to my Patreon group, actually, you know, I wasn't planning on sharing it, but I have that up on the side of my screen here. So I'll just go ahead and screenshot it and bring it in. Give me one second. Um, I showed a picture of the US dollar. Um, it should be loading right now. There we go. And basically, you know, it was coming into its weekly expected move, the lower level. So, you know, I was talking about the big gap up and I wanted to get this in front of everybody because if the dollar's coming down to that level, last week it did the same thing. And that's actually when I was buying, I bought dollars, bought um, UUP, right? It was the fund. It was right over here. And then we started to rally, right? So we're coming back down into that area and I figured, hey, it could be very well, you know, important level. Well, guess what? The dollar from that post at 648 in the morning started actually rallying. And that was right about here, right? So we posted it, you know, and then the market started selling off, right? There's a negative correlation. If you look at a correlation chart with the dollar relative to, you know, um, the S&P 500, to gold, to all these assets, right? There's a negative correlation. So if the dollar starts rising, that could also, you know, lend hand to put pressure on, um, equity markets. And as you can see, it did. Okay. And where did we drop down to? We dropped down to the week to date moving average. And then we started rallying, right? And then we came back down there again and we started rallying. It pretty much hung around the weekly expected move pretty much all day. Now, what do I, what's bullish about this chart? Well, first and foremost, it is right on that weekly expected move. So a breakaway could, could very well happen, right? It's holding above it still, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see it trade around this, you know, for the remainder of the week. It really depends on what Tesla, these big mega cap stocks do as far as, um, after their earnings. Now, what is bullish is we're above a five day moving average that is starting to turn up. Okay. We're above a quarter to date and month to date anchored VWAP, and that is starting to turn up and we're above a week to date moving, uh, uh, anchored VWAP. So as it stands right now, you know, buyers are in control. So it is bullish. That That's just what it is. So what, what I'm trying to tell you here is if we get big gap ups, you need to be careful and you need to be patient. What I, what I did, I'll show you actually what I did on the queues today. Um, pretty much out of the gate, I was shorting just because of the, uh, the, the look in the dollar, but I waited for the first flag to form. I was actually looking at the five minute time frame, and I recorded these I recorded these trades because I plan on sharing them on like YouTube shorts or TikTok or something like that. But we played a flag breakdown. It, it flagged again right over here um, on these five minute time frames, and then it broke down again. I covered some at the weekly expected and I covered some right again here. Um, if you're in the Patreon group, you already know that that's happened. And then I started looking, I started anchoring to right here and I started anchoring to right here and it created, actually, I'll just show you that too as well. Uh, I'll figure out, just share the trades that I took so you can see kind of my thought process. 
So this is what it looked like, what I, what I did intraday. Um, so first and foremost, I basically was looking for a potential for a kind of a, a U-turn type of trade, which means that I was looking to kind of just wait to be patient to see if it can get back above this anchored VWAP right over here. Um, and then potentially do a, somewhat of a U-turn and you buy the right side of it and you play for the flush. Now, it came up to here, but we didn't get up quite above it. So I tried trading this actually intraday right breaking down. So we had we had you know a low, we had a higher low, we had a higher low. And when it came up to here, you know, we didn't, we, I, I didn't want to just randomly take a stab at it, you know, and potentially, you know, because th there was no new, you know, a, a low to potentially take out. So we started pulling back. And when we started bouncing back up again, I was like, okay, if it comes down and breaks this low, I'll short it. So I shorted it here and I was like, I'm just going to hold on to it. And I started holding on to it, started seeing weakness. And then I moved my stop to break even. Okay. So it came back up and what happened? Well, I got stopped out at break even. And then I just waited. I waited for this potentially to still to take place. Right. So, and then take a look what happened right here. And like I said, I'll share this video, but we started rallying up and then it started performing it started getting above it and that right there was that u-turn and i bought right there on the right side of it and it came doodled around and then we had news drop on apple and that is basically where i sold out of it right over here is a quick day trade um i'm getting a little off topic but maybe you know just me explaining this to you kind of walks you through you know my intraday perspective because a lot can happen overnight so now going into tomorrow you may be like oh i remember he anchors it to this and then potentially you know you play from there a simple rule to follow is um one if it's above the daily if price is above the daily vwap right so if price is above the daily vwap um ah price is above the daily vwap you know go long don't short right if price is below the daily vwap don't go long and look for short setups. And then for swing trading, you want to go long when you're above that inclining five-day moving average, and you want to go short when the price action is below it, when price allows you to do so. Okay, so I know I'm kind of rambling on. As far as the uh, anchored VWAPs go, same situation here, right? We have this, um, uh, uh, this is the CPI report on October 13th. Right, we are trading above that. That's in confluence with the five-day moving average. So if price were to strike down here at some point come tomorrow, even if it gaps and comes way down here, that might be an area to cover shorts and or potentially look to see if it holds. And like I said, you know, you might be able to play the uh, right side of a potential U-turn right there and see if it actually holds as a level of support. And you can play that potential move to the upside. Um, but it is above the month to date, quarter to date. It's above uh, this uh, week to date too as well. So price action over here remains bullish as well, setting itself up for a potential tradable bottom. IWM, same situation right here. It got above that weekly expected move and it's been actually holding as a level of support and it's above all those key um, mo moving averages as well. Now, here's the warning signs. This movie's going on a little bit longer than I wanted. The warning signs is this. The VIX is still in the 30s. So what does that mean? It means that the market could move 2% swings. No problem still. Okay, so don't handicap risk. It can go up, it can go down, and it could be very, very violent. Same with the NASDAQ, right? NASDAQ 100 volatility, it's at 36.11. And same with Russell volatility, it's at 34.65. Yeah, it's coming off a little bit, but make no mistake, that is still high and that is still trending. We had the also... Um, the volatility kind of warning indicator fire off and indicate and it tells us that hey volatility may be around the corner and we're starting to see it kind of pull down a little bit here so we'll see if this signal plays out but remember this is to give you a heads up notice we've seen it also pull down like this and then fire off right we've seen it pull down then fire off we saw it pull down and then it was fired off so we could just be pulling down we may be in for firing off. Uh, last one over here is the ratio of the S&P 500 to TLT put in, um, continues to put in a higher uh, high over here. And the S&P 500 has not matched it. That is a negative divergence. When we've seen that taking place, we've seen the market sell off, sell off, sell off, sell off, and sell off throughout this bear market. Okay. And if this actually takes this high out. So for example, if we go here and S&P 500 continues up, but this continues up too, we're still looking at a divergence from there here to higher and then it would be from here and it'd still be potentially lower. So be aware of all your risks and hopefully um, today's video helped out, gave you some insight into my trading and so forth. Uh, yeah, see you later.